Chapter 5 of The Book of Werewolves. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Zaza. The Book of Werewolves by Sabine Beringold. Chapter 5 The Werewolf in the Middle Ages. Stories from Olaus Magnus of Livonian Werewolves. Story from Bishop Majolus. Story of Albertus Perikofsius. Similar occurrence at Prague, St. Patrick, strange incident related by John of Nuremberg, Bisclavre, Corland Werewolves, Pierre Vidal, Pavian Lycanthropist, Baudin's stories, Forestus' account of a lycanthropist, Neapolitan Werewolf. Olaus Magnus relates that in Prussia, Livonia, and Lithuania, although the inhabitants suffer considerably from the rapacity of wolves throughout the year, in that these animals rend their cattle, which are scattered in great numbers through the woods, whenever they strain the very least. Yet this is not regarded by them as such a serious matter as what they endure from men turned into wolves. On the feast of the Nativity of Christ, at night, such a multitude of wolves transformed from men gathered together in a certain spot arranged among themselves, and then spread to rage with wondrous ferocity against human beings, and those animals which are not wild, that the natives of these regions suffer more detriment from these than they do from true and natural wolves. For when a human habitation has been detected by them isolated in the woods, they besiege it with atrocity, striving to break in the doors, and in the event of their doing so, they devour all the human beings and every animal which is found within. They burst into the beer cellars, and there they empty the tons of beer or mead, and pile up the empty casks one above another in the middle of the cellar, thus showing their difference from natural and genuine wolves. Between Lithuania, Livonia, and Courland are the walls of a certain old ruined castle. On this spot congregate thousands on a fixed occasion and try their agility in jumping. Those who are unable to bound over the wall, as is often the case with the fattest, are fallen upon with scourges by the captains and slain. Olaus relates also in chapter 47 the story of a certain nobleman who was traveling through a large forest with some peasants in his retinue who dabbled in the black art. They found no house where they could lodge for the night and were well nigh famished. Then one of the peasants offered, if all the rest would hold their tongues as to what he should do, that he would bring them a lamb from a distant flock. He thereupon retired into the depths of the forest and changed his form into that of a wolf, fell upon the flock and brought a lamb to his companions in his mouth. They received it with gratitude. Then he retired once more into the thicket and transformed himself back again into his human shape. The wife of a nobleman in Livonia expressed her doubts to one of her slaves whether it were possible for man or woman thus to change shape. The servant at once volunteered to give her evidence of the possibility. He left the room, and in another moment a wolf was observed running over the country. The dogs followed him, and notwithstanding his resistance, tore out one of his eyes. Next day the slave appeared before his mistress blind of an eye. Bishop Majolus and Caspar Puser relate the following circumstances of the Livonians. At Christmas a boy lame of a leg goes round the country summoning the devil's followers, who are countless to a general conclave. Whoever remains behind or goes reluctantly is scourged by another with an iron whip till the blood flows, and his traces are left in blood. The human form vanishes, and the whole multitude become wolves. Many thousands assemble, foremost goes the leader armed with an iron whip, and the troop follow, firmly convinced in their imaginations that they are transformed into wolves. They fall upon herds of cattle and flocks of sheep, but they have no power to slay men. When they come to a river, the leader smites the water with his scourge, and it divides, leaving a dry path through the mist by which the pack may go. The transformation lasts during twelve days, at the expiration of which period the wolf skin vanishes and the human form reappears. This superstition was expressly forbidden by the church. Credidisti quod quidum credere solent, ut ilae quae a vulgo parque vocantur, ipsae well sint well possint hoc facere quod creduntur, id est dum aliquis homo nascitur et tunc valeant illum designare ad hoc quod velin, ut quondo cunque homo ile volverit, in lupum transformare possit, quod vulgaris stultitia werewolf vocat, aut in alium aliquam figuram? Burchard, 
1024. In like manner did St. Boniface preach against those who believed superstitiously in strigas et fictos lupos. Sermon Aput Mart et Durand, Chapter 9, 217. In a dissertation by Mueller, we learn on the authority of Cluverius and Danhaverus, Acad Homilet, page 2, that a certain Albertus Pericofsius in Muscovy was wont to tyrannize over and harass his subjects in the most unscrupulous manner. One night, when he was absent from home, his whole herd of cattle, acquired by extortion, perished. On his return he was informed of his loss, and the wicked man broke out into the most horrible blasphemies, exclaiming, let him who has slain eat. If God chooses, let him devour me as well. As he spoke, drops of blood fell to the earth, and the nobleman, transformed into a wild dog, rushed upon his dead cattle, tore and mangled the carcasses, and began to devour them. Possibly he may be devouring them still. Ac forsen hodi que pascitur. His wife then, near her confinement, died of fear. Of these circumstances there were not only ear, but also eyewitnesses. Non ab auritis tantum sed et oculatis acepi quod naro. Similarly, it is related of a nobleman in the neighborhood of Prague that he robbed his subjects of their goods and reduced them to penury through his exactions. He took the last cow from a poor widow with five children, but as a judgment, all his own cattle died. He then broke into fearful oaths, and God transformed him into a dog. His human head, however, remained. St. Patrick is said to have changed Vereticus, king of Wales, into a wolf, and St. Natalis, the abbot, to have pronounced anathema upon an illustrious family in Ireland, in consequence of which every male and female take the form of wolves for seven years and live in the forest and career over the bogs, howling mournfully and appeasing their hunger upon the sheep of the peasants. A duke of Prussia, according to Majolus, had a countryman brought for sentence before him because he had devoured his neighbor's cattle. The fellow was an ill-favored, deformed man with great wounds in his face which he had received from dog's bites whilst he had been in his wolf's form. It was believed that he had changed shape twice in the year, at Christmas and at Midsummer. He was said to exhibit much uneasiness and discomfort when the wolf hair began to break out and his bodily shape to change. He was kept long in prison and closely watched, lest he should become a werewolf during his confinement and attempt to escape, but nothing remarkable took place. If this is the same individual as that mentioned by Olaus Magnus, as there seems to be a probability, the poor fellow was burned alive. John of Nuremberg relates the following curious story. A priest was once traveling in a strange country and lost his way in a forest. Seeing a fire, he made towards it and beheld a wolf seated over it. The wolf addressed him in a human voice and bade him not fear, as he was of the Assyrian race, of which a man and a woman were doomed to spend a certain number of years in a wolf's form. Only after seven years might they return home and resume their former shapes if they were still alive. He begged the priest to visit and console his sick wife and to give her the last sacraments. This the priest consented to do, after some hesitation, and only when convinced of the beasts being human beings, by observing that the wolf used his front paws as hands, and when he saw the she-wolf peel off her wolf-skin from her head to her navel, exhibiting the features of an aged woman. Marie de France says in the Lay du Bisclaveret, Bisclaveret ad non en Breton, garois la planli normand. Jadis le poète hum war et souvent sur les avenir hum plus air garwal deviendra eux et boscage mais s'entendre. There is an interesting paper by Ranaeus on the Courland werewolves in the Breslauer Samlong. The author says there are too many examples derived not merely from hearsay but received on indisputable evidence for us to dispute the fact that Satan if we do not deny that such a being exists and that he has his work in the children of darkness, holds the lycanthropists in his net in three ways. 1. They execute as wolves certain acts, such as seizing a sheep or destroying cattle, etc., not changed into wolves, which no scientific man in Courland believes, but in their human frames and with their human limbs, yet in such a state of fantasy and hallucination that they believe themselves transformed into wolves and are regarded as such by others suffering under similar hallucination. And in this manner run these people in packs of wolves, though not true wolves. 
Two, they imagine in deep sleep or dream that they injure the cattle, and this without leaving their couch. But it is their master who does in their stead what their fancy points out or suggests to him. Three, the evil one drives natural wolves to do some act, and then pictures it so well to the sleeper, immovable in his place, both in dreams and at awaking, that he believes the act to have been committed by himself. Raneus, under these heads, relates three stories which he believes he has on good authority. The first is of a gentleman starting on a journey who came upon a wolf engaged in the act of seizing a sheep in his own flock. He fired at it and wounded it so that it fled howling to the thicket. When the gentleman returned from his expedition, he found the whole neighborhood impressed with the belief that he had, on a given day and hour, shot at one of his tenants, a publican, Michael. On inquiry, the man's wife, called Leba, related the following circumstances, which were fully corroborated by numerous witnesses. When her husband had sown his rye, he had consulted with his wife how he was to get some meat so as to have a good feast. The woman urged him on no account to steal from his landlord's flock because it was guarded by fierce dogs. He, however, rejected her advice, and Mickle fell upon his landlord's sheep. But he had suffered and had come limping home, and in his rage at the ill success of his attempt, had fallen upon his own horse and had bitten its throat completely through. This took place in the year 1684. In 1684, a man was about to fire upon a pack of wolves, when he heard from among the troop a voice exclaiming, Gossip! Gossip! Don't fire! No good will come of it! The third story is as follows. A lycanthropist was brought before a judge and accused of witchcraft, but as nothing could be proved against him, the judge ordered one of his peasants to visit the man in his prison and to worm the truth out of him, and to persuade the prisoner to assist him in revenging himself upon another peasant who had injured him. And this was to be effected by destroying one of the man's cows, but the peasant was to urge the prisoner to do it secretly, and, if possible, in the disguise of a wolf. The fellow undertook the task, but he had great difficulty in persuading the prisoner to fall in with his wishes. Eventually, however, he succeeded. Next morning, the cow was found in its stall, frightfully mangled, but the prisoner had not left his cell, for the watch who had been placed to observe him declared that he had spent the night in profound sleep, and that he had only at one time made a slight motion with his head and hands and feet. Vierius and Forestus quote Guglielmus Brabantinus as an authority for the fact that a man of high position had been so possessed by the evil one that often during the year he fell into a condition in which he believed himself to be turned into a wolf, and at that time he roved in the woods and tried to seize and devour little children, but that at last by God's mercy he recovered his senses. Certainly the famous Pierre Vidal, the Don Quixote of Provençal troubadours, must have had a touch of this madness when, after having fallen in love with a lady of Carcassonne named Loba, or the Wolfess, the excess of his passion drove him over the country howling like a wolf and demeaning himself more like an irrational beast than a rational man. He commemorates his lupine madness in the poem Atal Donna. Crowned with immortal joys, I mount the proudest emperors above, for I am honoured with the love of the fair daughter of a count. A lace from Na Rembauda's hand, I value more than all the land, of Richard with his Poicton, his rich Touraine, and famed Anjou. When Lugarou the rabble call me, when vagrant shepherds hoot, pursue and buffet me to boot, it doth not for a moment gall me. I seek not palaces or halls or refuge when the winter falls, exposed to winds and frosts at night. My soul is ravished with delight. Me claims my she-wolf, Loba, so divine, and justly she that claim prefers, for by my troth my life is hers, more than another's, more than mine. Job Finkelius relates the sad story of a farmer of Pavia who, as a wolf, fell upon many men in the open country and tore them to pieces. After much trouble the maniac was caught, and he then assured his captors that the only differences which existed between himself and a natural wolf was that in a true wolf the hair grew outward whilst in him it struck inward. In order to put this assertion to the proof, the magistrates themselves, most certainly cruel and bloodthirsty wolves, cut off his arms and legs. The poor wretch died of the mutilation. This took place in 1541. The idea of the skin being reversed is a very ancient one, 
Versipellis occurs as a name of reproach in Petronius, Lucilius, and Plautus, and resembles the Norse Hamrammer. Finkelius relates also that in 1542 there was such a multitude of werewolves about Constantinople that the emperor, accompanied by his guard, left the city to give them a severe correction and slew 150 of them. Spranger speaks of three young ladies who attacked a laborer under the form of cats and were wounded by him. They were found bleeding in their beds next morning. Majolus relates that a man afflicted with lycanthropy was brought to Pomponatius. The poor fellow had been found buried in hay, and when people approached, he called to them to flee, as he was a werewolf and would rend them. The country folk wanted to flay him to discover whether the hair grew inwards, but Pomponatius rescued the man and cured him. Baudin tells some werewolf stories on good authority. It is a pity that the good authorities of Baudin were such liars, but that, by the way. He says that the royal procurator, General Bourdin, had assured him that he had shot a wolf and that the arrow had struck in the beast's thigh. A few hours after the arrow was found in the thigh of a man in bed. In Vernon, about the year 1566, the witches and warlocks gathered in great multitudes under the shape of cats. Four or five men were attacked in a lone place by a number of these beasts. The men stood their ground with the utmost heroism, succeeded in slaying one puss, and in wounding many others. Next day a number of wounded women were found in the town, and they gave the judge an accurate account of all the circumstances connected with their wounding. Baudin quotes Pierre Marnet, the author of a treatise on sorcerers, as having witnessed in Savoy the transformation of men into wolves. Ninold relates that in a village of Switzerland near Lucerne, a peasant was attacked by a wolf whilst he was hewing timber. He defended himself and smote off a foreleg of the beast. The moment that the blood began to flow, the wolf's form changed, and he recognized a woman without her arm. She was burnt alive. In evidence that beasts are transformed witches is to be found in their having no tails. When the devil takes human form, however, he keeps his club foot of the satyr as a token by which he may be recognized. So animals deficient in caudal appendages are to be avoided, as they are witches in disguise. The thing world should consider the case of the Manx cats in its next session. Forestus, in his chapter on maladies of the brain, relates a circumstance which came under his own observation in the middle of the 16th century at Alkmaar in the Netherlands. A peasant there was attacked every spring with a fit of insanity. Under the influence of this, he rushed about the churchyard, ran into the church, jumped over the benches, danced, was filled with fury, climbed up, descended, and never remained quiet. He carried a long staff in his hand with which he drove away the dogs which flew at him and wounded him, so that his thighs were covered with scars. His face was pale, his eyes deep sunk in their sockets. Forestus pronounces the man to be a lycanthropist, but he does not say that the poor fellow believed himself to be transformed into a wolf. In reference to this case, however, he mentions that of a Spanish nobleman who believed himself to be changed into a bear, and who wandered filled with fury among the woods. Donatus of Altomare affirms that he saw a man in the streets of Naples, surrounded by a ring of people, who in his werewolf frenzy had dug up a corpse and was carrying off the leg upon his shoulders. This was in the middle of the 16th century. End of chapter 5. Recording by Kristen Zaza, Toronto, Ontario.